KLS, The Lola Show. Hello Nigeria, my name is Lola Senussi and welcome once again to The Lola Show TLS. We have traveled all the way from Lagos to the city of Ibada to meet this sought after personality and I bet you know who I'm talking about. Please welcome with me, Malam Nasiru El Rufai. El Rufai on education. Without good education, it is difficult in today's world for a person to even be happy. El Rufai on corruption. Then there are many opportunities to be corrupt. As the demolition man. They thought that we only picked on those that were not connected. On privatization. Yes, Nigeria now carries a phone. But this was not the case in 2001. El Rufai on the way he is. I was brought up to just do the right thing. It's great to have you. Thank you. I have sought you out ever since you left office. It's been how long now since you left office? Very long. I can't even remember. More than five years. It seems as if it was yesterday. Not for me. For me, it's been a long, long time. It's because we miss you. Uh, well, for, I, I don't miss you. <laughs> Buja misses you. El Rufai was a former minister of the Federal Capital Territory in Abuja from 2003 to 2007 and was also the former Director General of the Bureau of Enterprises from 2000 to 2004. He is known to be an accidental public servant. He is also known as the privatization czar and more recently as Mr. Demolition. We all know that you came from a very humble beginning where school was unaffordable and you had to be taken in by your uncle who sent you to school. You prevailed and you are who you are now. Can you t please tell us your background? Well, um, you are right. Uh, I come from a very humble background. Uh, my father was a pensioner when he gave birth to me. He had retired from the services of the Northern Regional Government and was on a three pounds a month pension. Uh, but we all went to school. School was affordable because it was free. The educational policy of the Northern Regional Government then was that school was virtually free. Our parents only spent money to sew uniforms for us. Everything else was free. So we went to school, but in class two, my father died. And then my uncle took me over as his uh, son. And we moved to Kaduna. And I continued school from Kaduna. Then went to Barewa College for my secondary education, Ahmad Bell University, and so on and so forth. You've always described yourself as a Nigerian first before being referred to as a Hausa Malam. It's exciting for me to hear that you're talking about education, but you, you have to understand that in the northern part or some of the other areas where foreign education is frowned upon, how do you enlighten? No, no, no. You know, I, I think, I think there, is a, there is a misunderstanding about the attitude of uh, northerners in particular to education. Uh, it is true that in the 40s, 50s, even in the 60s, there was an attitude of suspicion towards Western education. Western education. Okay? And in fact, part of the reason why uh, my father got some education was because his uncle was a district head and the colonialists required every district head to put one of his children in school <laughs> and he felt that he would not put his own biological children, but put his own uh, nephew. That's, that, 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 that's how many of, you know. So, but that has changed now. Every family, every parent wants to send his child to school. But there, is, there, there are two problems. The first problem is poverty. Poverty levels in the north are much higher than the rest of the country. So for many people, paying the school fees is a challenge. Now, Many parents can truly not afford the, not only the school fees, which are no longer free in the North. Free education is no longer free. No, it's no longer free, but uniforms, books, you know, in our time, you just, 
<laughs> get uniforms and go to school. They give you the textbooks, exercise books, everything. Today it has changed. In many states in the north, school fees are payable. It's not free. And in addition, you incur the expenses of textbooks and so on and so forth. So th this is one problem. Okay. The second problem, of course, is the link between education and outcomes. Okay. When I was growing up, one could see that if you got an education, there was a job ready for you, m employment, move to the GRA, car loan, social mobility. Today, you have thousands, perhaps millions of graduates, university graduates, that have no work. Doesn't that have to do with the rate at which Nigeria multiplies? Um, For example, you said nine in your family. Yeah, whatever the rate is. Mm -hmm. People look at the reality on the ground and say, this education is not worth it. This is my point, okay? Because I spent all this money, put my child through school, he's out of school, he doesn't have a job, he still lives with me, okay? I have to feed him. So the dream of going to school, that process has been broken. So there is a breakdown between acquiring education and the social mobility that education used to bring. And this is more clearly evident in the north where people expected an easy life once you have an education. Education now becomes a dime a dozen. Precisely. And there are no opportunities. We have governors in the north that are not conscious of their responsibility, not only to educate, but to create an environment that will, that will have jobs for the people that come out. Because not all of them can be absorbed by the public service. Okay, so this is the, this is the problem. This is the problem happening in the north and if you look at the unemployment statistics they almost completely correlate with instability violence and religious extremism because three out of four young people in Yobe state are unemployed so it is not surprising that Boko Haram is very strong in Yobe state two out of three young people below the age of 30 in Borno state are, were unemployed even if they are not employed by the government or by a corporation, they can at least develop through education a trade, yeah. self-enhancement. But you see, this is, again, this is the danger of the kind of educational system we have. We have an educational system that produces white-collar yeah. uh, workers. The people that expect that once they have a degree, they, have they must have an office job. Very few people will uh, get a degree in mechanical engineering and open a mechanical workshop. They want to be engineers in an office. In an office. So, you know, there, there, there are all these issues, but what is happening in the North is this breakdown and a feeling of hopelessness. And it is causing all kinds of... What is the way out of this? Well, you know, the, the way out, like everything else in any society, is better governance, better leaders, responsible leaders. But if you're not educating the young ones who are going to be the leaders, when, where do you then get the leaders from, from outside of the country? Well, right now, you have leaders at a particular age. How do you shape the leaders that are already in place? I don't know, because some of the leaders we have are really not the ones that should be there. But they are there. And because they did not think through being leaders and what the responsibilities of leadership are, we are in a vicious circle in which you have incompetent leaders not discharging their responsibilities. And this is leading to the creation of a future generation of even worse leaders. So we are really in a quagmire. I don't know how we'll get out of it as a country. Uh, some problems are more serious in some parts of the country than others, but there is a problem. It's a national problem. And I really don't know how we'll get out of it. We're in a vicious circle, and unless someone comes in and terminates that circle and takes some very hard and difficult decisions, are you happy with Nigeria? No, because the criminals are in charge. How do you shape the leaders that are already in place? There is a problem. It's a national problem. Are these problems what other countries should be hearing about Nigeria? The country is just going down and down and down and I don't know where we'll end up. You were the El Rufai, incorruptible public servant. Could that be one of the fears? I, I, I don't know. What was the method of corruption actually that would, that would plague the office? What was the method that you refused? What was it that, will, that you were saying no to? 
no, no, no. You, you see, once you're in public office in Nigeria uh, with broken rules and a broken dysfunctional system, there are many opportunities to be corrupt. I mean, as a matter of habit, people will be offering you money anyway. You mean like gifts? Yeah. To change your policies to, to favor them? Yeah, to change policies to favor them, to change a decision in their favor, to refrain from taking a decision inimical to them. That will be detrimental to the large citizen of... The yes. Mostly detrimental to the citizenry, but of interest to them. I, I'll just give one example of how this works. Okay, let's take the fuel subsidy scam. Okay, what is it? Basically, the policy is to bring in gasoline and sell it at a price below cost so that Nigerians can enjoy the benefit of buying it at a lower price. So because you are importing it at more than the cost you want to sell it, there is a, sub, there is a difference. That's the difference is the subsidy. Okay? Now if that works, if, if, if you give, if you appoint established oil importers to do this and you pay the Exxon Mobiles of this world, the Shell and the Chevrons to do this, everything will be done properly. Because these companies, these companies cannot afford to tarnish their reputation by going into such games, okay? But this is Nigeria, so what do we do? We don't want these companies with a reputation to do that. We ask Lola to form a company and we give you the contract to bring in the products. Mm -hmm. Because you're promoting a Nigeria. So that, yeah, that, that will be the argument. But we want to promote indigenization, we don't trust these multinationals. So Lola starts that. Maybe Lola is a serious business and she learns this business and she does it properly. But then what happens? Somebody then figures out that, look, we don't need to even import this product. We can just generate the paperwork to look like the products have been imported and we can get a few hundred million as payment. That's what the first subsidy scam is all about. And many of them have not even imported. You see, if they imported the product, then they are due for payment. But when they do not import even a drop of gasoline and they collect a billion. There was a company that came to NNPC in the Farouk Lawan report and said, we want to do waste management. This is our area. And they told them, don't do that. There is money in subsidy. Go and form a company that will import. But them. isn't there a check and balance? Someone who everyone is on the take. You see, if you have a billion Naira that you have not worked for, that is enough to share. You know, you, you have enough money to pay off everyone that is paid to check. Because this guy paid to check is on a salary of 200,000 naira per, per, per month. He beats the monthly by salary. The time, by the time you give him 50 million, he's got his pension. Okay. And generates the papers and signs yeah, the papers. Yeah, he signs. And he's not scared because even if he's dismissed from service, he still has his... Are these problems what other countries should be hearing about Nigeria? No. Unfortunately, this is what happens. Um, the system is broken, virtually everyone is on the take, those that are supposed to enforce the law are on the take, those that are supposed to check these things, you know, it is an insidious system and uh, I don't know where we'll draw the line and stop this because the country is just going down and down and down and I don't know where we'll end up. I think we've lost something, we've lost some core values that every society that needs to function should have. Excuse, how could you have kept a low profile with all this information? And you, Because while you were the minister in Abuja, which is still reflective of today modern Abuja, you were untouchable. How could you have decided to go low profile? I, I have spent most of my life in the private sector before coming into public service. And that's where I have always felt I belonged. Uh, and once we were done uh, in the Obasanjo administration, my plan was to go back to school for a couple of years and then come back to Nigeria and start a think tank. That was my plan. What made you, what some of the leaders do not have now, that tells you I'm going to do this, this is the right way at all cost. What was that drive when you were bulldozing homes? <laughs> you, know, you know I was brought up that way. I was brought up to just do the right thing. 
to the right thing. Yeah. Uh, that's how I was brought up. I don't know how to do, how to behave any other way. That is one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Because if I don't do that, you know, I just you don't never sleep well. You accused of bribery. Uh, you never had any scandal. So you, you definitely gonna sleep well at night. Yeah. Well, you know, I, 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 I have been accused. I mean, after I left office, uh, the Eradu administration did everything to try to smear me. They investigated me. But you know what? They never found that I, I've taken a penny. Uh, I'm being prosecuted now in court for approving the allocation of a plot of land to my wife. That is why I am in court with the government. Uh, but they could never say that I took one penny. And I'm very proud of that. Uh, and they, it's, not, it's not for lack of looking. If you go to the EFCC website, you will see the names of, uh, names of corrupt politicians. My name is there. Against each politician's name, there is an amount that the EFCC is charging for. They have nothing against my name. They just have it there for show, you know, to show that, uh, you know, to, 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 to smear me, I would say. And at the right time, when the court cases are over, I will also, uh, you know, exercise my legal rights. But so, you know, as long as if you spend a day in government, people think they can find something to pin on you. Everyone seems to be prosecuted after they leave office or what? smeared in one way or the other. Yeah. What, 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 is the, what is the fame of wanting to be in office then? I think that's the whole idea. The whole idea is to smear anyone that has tried to do a decent job because the criminals are in charge and they don't want any good person around. So if you go into government and try to do an honest job, they must find a way to make you look like them. And it is a signal to young people and others that want to be like uh, Nuhu for instance, that you know will get you. It is it is sad that we've come to that, but that is the reality, and I don't know when it will change. You're not going to say anything because we've hardly taken a break. We've just been enjoying this wonderful conversation. Welcome back to TLS, The Lola Show. We've had the pleasure of speaking with Malam Nasir El Rufai, uh, forever looking young. <laughs> Before we go, you must uh, answer that question of being uh, referred to as a demolition man in Abuja, where you were fearlessly, again, I will use the word, demolishing properties and illegal, I will, that's the term you use, illegal constructions. Yes. Well, we, in the FCT, we didn't use the word demolition. We said removal mm -hmm. of existence. Uh, of but if you removed, you will have to place it elsewhere. No, you can remove and take it to the doctor. <laughs> That's what we're doing. Um, no, you, you, know, you, you know, part of the reason why we had to do what we had to do was because Abuja was becoming chaotic. Okay, there was breakdown in the regulatory system of zoning, building in the right places, and so on. And uh, one of the uh, directives President Obasanjo gave me uh, was to put an end to that and re recover as much as, as possible, you know, with some sanity. So that, that, that's, what you, that, that's what we did. And, uh, and I think in the beginning, people were cynical about our intentions. They thought that we only picked on those that were not connected uh, and so on but when we demolished the the house of our former inspector general of police unbelievable uh, former chief of defense staff <laughs> a minister a serving minister and a senator i think people began to say okay then the pdp chairman you know the pdp chairman yes came a little later because we didn't know that the pdp chairman's house amadou ali's house violated uh, the plan by sitting on a water line 
water uh, line. Yeah, it was sitting on a trunk water line. So we, we, you know, once we identified, you know, we removed it. You were doing your job. Precisely. And the rules should apply, even to the PDP national chairman. And we did that. And to give credit to President Obasanjo, he supported us all through, you know. And uh, I will never stop complimenting and expressing our gratitude to him for being there. I mean, no matter how difficult it appeared, no matter how much it affected his friends, once we showed that there was a violation, he, he, he supported us. And uh, we did that. And uh, I was giving all kinds of names. But, you know, I think uh, towards the end, people began to see... And this is what Abuja is enjoying. Precisely. Uh, the people began to see the logic behind some of the painful decisions we had to take. And trust me, taking down a building is painful, particularly for me. Uh, I'm a quantity surveyor. I make a living from seeing buildings go up, not removing them. But, you know, one has to always do the right thing, no matter how inconvenient. And that is what guided uh, our policies. And I must say that for the four years we were there and the hundreds of buildings that we took down, we never made one mistake, which many people have refused to recognize and compliment us. But it was a tribute to how thorough we were and how, how, how honest the public servants were in doing the reviews. Uh, we had to establish everything was proper, you know, before we did it. Let's go to energy, energy reforms, power sector, what's happening in the country. Is this a good thing for Nigeria? It is, it is. In fact, all the monopoly sectors we have in Nigeria ought to be reformed in a similar You've manner. You've always been the king of privatization. Yes. We spearheaded the reforms of many of these monopoly sectors in BPE. Uh, the first one we did was the telecom sector, and the results are clear. You know, when you deregulate a sector in an orderly manner mm -hmm. and following the four steps we outlined in BPE then, you are likely to get it right. And in the medium term, things will be easier for everybody. Now, what we did in telecoms, as an example, which everyone can relate to because every Nigerian now carries a phone, but this was not the case in 2001. In 2001, there are less than half a million telephones in Nigeria. And uh, getting a phone line requires you to fill forms and wait for years or bribe officials. But today you walk in and get the same card. What happened between then and now? We did things in four steps. The first, uh, we, we rewrote the telecoms policy. Okay. Uh, to suggest that the telecom sector should be deregulated, demonopolized. We should not have one NITEL serving the whole country. We should have several NITELs. Definitely. When we got the policy written, we then drafted legislation to do away with every monopolistic uh, protection that NITEL had. Then the legislation strengthened the regulator, the NCC. The NCC was in existence, but it was weak. It could only regulate NITEL under the old policy. Right. By the time we wrote the new policy, they could do so. And that was what gave them the capacity to issue licenses to the GSM operators that we now have. Okay? And then, of course, finally, the last step was to privatize NITEL. On that note, I want to really thank you for taking the time out because I really want, I know that when you go to Abuja now, you're pleased and it's, it's like eye candy. Everybody wants to visit Abuja and mainly because you spearheaded the wonderful change which we enjoy today. Thank you so very much for coming on the program. Thank you and I hope you move to Abuja to enjoy <laughs> what we have done. I visit Abuja once in a while. <laughs>